Hi, Joe. Hello, Stefano. Good to Thank see you. you. Nice to see you. Um, thank you very much for, for your time and for joining this uh, new uh, web series, which I titled War as Reset. I would like this series, following what Andrew Samuel suggested, uh, to help us understand better what is going on around us and doing so from the Jungian perspective. Andrew Samuel suggested within both the microcosm of an individual and the macrocosm of the global village, we are floated by psychological themes and that politics embodies the psyche of a people. Andrew actively demonstrated how useful and effective perspective derived from psychotherapy might be in the formation of policy, in new ways of thinking about the political process and in the resolution of conflicts. Therefore, this series is an opportunity for depth and to contrast or even compensate, which is a word that we Jungians like very much, to compensate the current media warriorism where we eat war on a daily basis. War is seen as an attraction. The attraction is to eat war. We are attracted by war, maybe like Votan. We wish war to be as far as possible, but then we watch it on TV. Let's start with Jung, being Jungians is always helpful. And I would like to start with Wotan, Collective Works number 10, paragraph 371 and 372. Jung wrote at the very beginning of Wotan, when we look back to the time before 1914, we find ourselves living in a world of events, which would have been inconceivable before the war. We were even beginning to regard war between civilized nations as a fable, thinking that such an absurdity would become less and less possible in our rational, internationally organized world. And what came after the war was a veritable witch's Sabbath. What is going on right now, Joe? Mm -hmm. Well, these are activations of the collective unconscious in my mind that we're we're facing and looking at, and they do have a cyclical pattern. I, I suggest, I'm not certain, but the feeling I get is that we're in the midst, we're on the cusp of a shift. There's a change in archetypal patterns, and we're seeing a struggle between those opposing forces, almost like tectonic plates moving against one another. The old heroic egoic states that identified individuation as who we were and how we saw ourselves as people and as cultures and nations is no longer va valid. There's a, there's a need for a much broader ecological understanding of the way we're interdependent on one another. And that's creating an enormous friction. This is the regressive move that we're looking at to restore old empires of one sort or another, whether it's in the US and its imperialism or whether it's Russia or whether it's China. Uh, the, the major powers are, are in the grip of that kind of polarization, I believe. How does religion, spirituality deal with this? Because if we follow Jung, he says, paragraph 372, but in the sphere of religion, we can see at once that some very significant things have been happening. We need to feel no surprise that in Russia, the colorful splendors of the Easter Orthodox Church have been superseded by the movement of the godless. And then he continues, and however deplorable the low spiritual level of the scientific reaction, it was inevitable that the 19th century scientific enlightenment should one day dawn in Russia. It's interesting that Jung was writing about Russia when Russia, after the revolution, became what we know, uh, religionless, spiritualless. Right. And now, uh, Putin is using the Bible to say that um, there is no bigger love than to give your life for your friends. Or Kirill, the patriarch from Moscow, is saying this is a war against the uh, secularized Western society against the gay pride, against LBGTQI. Yeah. It's like the other way around. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, it's a kind of what is the relationship to the numinous when you try to drive it in completely out of your society, then it comes back in a repressed and rather terrifying form, I think. So one of the questions here is, what is our relationship to the numinous? Is this part of what we're experiencing in, in these conflicts? And for me, uh, you know, from an academic perspective, um, and I think Jung is a part of this movement, would be the re-enchantment of the world. The, the Enlightenment view really did uh, end up where uh, Max Weber in 1917-18 is talking about the, the, the sort of disenchantment of reality because of that scientific view. That's the loss of the gods right there. And yet that's at the same time Jung is undergoing his Red Book experiences and you see the, the uh, raw rising up of the numinous energies. Uh, in not only in him, but in other artists and so forth. And so that I think that's part of the question that we're facing going forward. What is our relationship to the numinous? Um, I mean, Putin wants to grab it for political reasons. Um, certainly Trump, make America great again, does something very similar, I think. And, and it's a kind of secular misuse of the numinous. Uh, it's using it as a, a regressive restoration of something rather than a kind of transformational energy towards something new that's trying to emerge. And I think that's one of the dilemmas we're facing. Can you, in very simple words, because on YouTube people yeah, okay. might need uh, a little help, uh, what is the numinous, what is okay. enchantment, and what is re-enchantment? There is a hope, actually, I would say. Yeah, well, let's start with the term numinous. Um, it was coined by a man, Rudolf Otto. He was a you know historian of religions. Uh, around uh, the time uh, Jung was writing, he wrote a book called The Idea of the Numinous, and Jung picked this up right away. It's the sense of awe or uh, how overwhelmed we feel at a psycho-emotional level when we encounter something really, truly other and truly much greater than ourselves. And it can valence positive or negative. It can be terrifying. Uh, the sublime is often a kind of an approach to some aspects of that. But it's any kind of encounter where we experience something much greater than ourselves that takes us out of ourselves and brings us into um, contact with something that uh, we may not have given credit to uh, for existing prior to this. And certainly religious and mystical experiences that's what they are. They're all about uh, the study of um, numinous experience. William James's variety of uh, religious experiences would be a, a, a case book study in, in, in the forms of the numinous, as it were. Yeah, for disenchantment and reenchantment, this was a kind of cultural theory, a sociological theory. Weber was a sociologist, and what he was talking about was the way in which there was an imagined uh, progression from uh, primitive, and I use this in, in scare quotes because these are not terms that I would personally use, <laughs> but that primitive persons had um, a kind of magical orientation to the world that gradually became codified by religious uh, forms. And then ultimately uh, the control of nature and the understanding of the world was superseded from a religious perspective by a scientific perspective. This is really starts with greatest intensity in the 17th century in, in the West uh, with our scientific revolution so that by the end of the 19th century, physicists are, are senior physicists are saying to young students, don't come into this field. Everything is pretty much wrapped up. We're just refining the numbers. There's nothing new to discover. That's the kind of arrogance that was in that disenchantment, that we could know everything. And of course, quantum mechanics, relativity, and the discovery of the unconscious flipped all of that. And it raises a question of whether in those indigenous cultures, the way in which they saw spirits and demons and, and all kinds of uh, animated forms in the world, that that enchantment of the world is not just a metaphoric misreading, a superstitious, uh, uninformed vision, but it actually speaks to some dynamic in out in the world itself. And that to recover that, and I think synchronicity, for example, is Jung's idea of synchronicity, is an attempt to look at the way the psyche and the oxide world are porous, the way they engage with one another. And out of that, 
you get a re-enchantment. You get a sense where the world is reanimated, that we feel its vitality, not just my projection of my psyche onto the world, but there's something in the world itself, a world soul at a, a deep level. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. I wrote a paper called The Numinous and the Fall of the Berlin Wall, where I claimed that that Peach Freudian sleep speech by Shabosky, that was one of the highest ranking politician, when during a press conference on the 9th of, 11, uh, uh, 9th of November uh, 89, ask, when are you allowing people to, to go abroad? He said so forth, that in German means right now. My idea is that the numinous that they put him in a trance where the trained and seasoned politician would ne never answer that way, but would have said, well, we will share more information, but is the collective unconscious, the tension that was boiling since month and month might have brought him to say this, this were in a state that is not conscious, is not unconscious. Right. Yes, uh, I mean, I think finding ways back to value those kinds of what we would call altered or non-ordinary states of consciousness are extremely important. You know, and I've gotten interested in oracles in the, the last number of years um, because of following the altered states of consciousness, uh, going back to looking at Delphi and the priestess of Delphi, who was the oracle of Apollo, uh, and when you study that, the classicists of the 21st century are opening our eyes to some very new things. They're saying, you know, Med Mediterranean civilization was stabilized for more than 2,000 years by this group of middle-aged women who had no political power. But they had this contact with the numinous and that they were able to deliver these kinds of often cryptic messages that caused a pause and a reflection on what people were doing, that they would be consulted and the the kind of multi-leveled, I would say a surplus of meaning that was in their statements, meant that people had to go back and really reflect on what they were doing and why they were doing it. Uh, our linear um, solving problems and getting to a um, single conclusion uh, forecloses on that. We've lost that oracular sense. I think that's what Jung was after in the Red Book. He 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 had visionary experiences. What to do with these? And we need them now more than ever. What what is our political vision? Who do, where do we get our visionary information from? Uh, this is this is a very important point and question. Let's switch for a moment to the concept of the masculine and the feminine. And maybe it will be banal, but Perhaps the more enlightenment, the more scientific knowledge, the more linear world, the more masculine, mm -hmm. the less the numinous, the less the, uh, the enchantment, the less the feminine. Is it banal? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think the split for us is starting to be uh, one possible way to reverse that is through complexity, because that linear understanding breaks down. You can take it. It's very powerful when you solve certain kinds of problems, but the further you go with it, you start to reach an area where you can't solve these problems. You have to avoid them because they're in between. They don't fit into this or that. And when you start to move towards a complexity model, you need more intuition. You need a holistic vision that, that encompasses patterns and that you start to be able to perceive patterns. Well, that's traditionally been on the feminine side. I mean, I'm always a little uncomfortable with our binaries around this, as, as I'm sure you are as well. But okay. but I think the idea is, is some kinds of consciousness that are more permeable, permeable rather than just these polarized forms that we've been um, seduced by in our, in our uh, patriarchies. The question, obviously, was trying not to be banal, but to provoke the next question. That is, is war masculine? You know, that's a, it's a very difficult question. I, I've, I've wondered about this. Uh, there's masculine desire in war. I think desire is a very interesting piece of this. The, the kind of, uh, whether you call it bloodlust or whatever, the, the link between the erotic and the, uh, the violence of war, whether it's, you know, it's power, it's sexuality used in, a, in the form of power. But I think that 
fascination and captivation is part of the dance. Uh, and that um, often war is is um, framed in terms of uh, winning feminine attention and so forth. I mean, you know, whether it's Eleanor Troy or on and on and on throughout history, we've had this um, the movement, the, the marriage of Venus and Mars, you know, uh, the the erotics that are in there. That I think that's one of the one of the potent instinctual energies that's not so easy to find what William James called a moral equivalent of war. Because you have to begin to deal with that level of desire. Can women be warriors? Absolutely, the Amazons, and certainly we see contemporary women quite able to, to be into fights uh, of, of varying levels of sophistication. So I, I don't think it only is the masculine psyche, but there's an element in the masculine psyche that um, really brings in the irrational in a much more powerful way. I think that's one of the things is to, how do we understand that? Uh, how do we get into relationship with that? In my opening introduction, I propose that we eat war, that war is an attraction. We are really attracted by war. Um, I think that war is the opposite than what Truman Capote called the Vanity Fair. Actually, war is the atrocity fair. Yes. But, but through the media, through TV, it becomes a vanity fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is war? Oh, that's an age-old human question, isn't it? I mean, you know, certainly it's a, a polarization to extremes. It's opposites where they cannot find a third position. There's a collapse of tension. Uh, whenever war breaks out, I mean, it means that all of the work that might have been there to have something peaceful uh, has been defeated. And I think that's a, it's a real challenge for our rational thought, because we think that we have ways to try to get beyond the kind of power of these emotions. But they, it seems to me, it's when things get really torn asunder. Uh, that, that war is a manifestation of a, a, of a kind of in cultural paranoid schizoid state. That is where you project all the evil and, and negativity onto the other, and that becomes your justification for the atrocities that you then deliver onto them. And the inability to stay in relationship and to work with that tension has, um, has really evaporated when, when we get to these states. Two days ago, our colleague Catalina Bertoli told me, answering right. the question, war is failure. And yes. today, uh, Padre Giuseppe Bettoni, an Italian priest, a woman very, very uh, close to it, told me, war is blasphemy. Especially if you look at what Putin said and Kirill said. But I would like to share with you the words of someone that is very, very dear to you with whom you work closely. Uh, each yeah. uh, I think you know who I'm referring to, James Hillman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in his book, A Terrible Love for War, he said, there is no practical solution to war because war is not a problem solvable by the practical mind, which is better equipped for its conduct than for its avoidance or conclusion. War belongs to our soul as an archetypal truth of the cosmos. It is a human war and an inhuman horror, and a love that no other love has been able to overcome. We can open our eyes to this terrible truth and, becoming aware of it, devote our all passionate intensity to undermining the enactment of war, strengthened by the courage that culture possesses even in the dark ages, to continue to sing as it resists war. We can understand it better, postpone it longer, work to gradually remove it from the support of a hypocritical religion, but the war as such will remain until the gods themselves leave. Mm. Two, two sentences stay with me. Love that no other love has been able to overcome, 
And war is a love that no other love has been able to overcome. And war as such will remain until the gods themselves leave. Didn't the gods leave? I mean, Nietzsche killed God is dead. Freud said that religion is an illusion. But then you brought the gods back. Yes. And yes. Then gods became sicknesses. Yes, yeah, they got to become illness and disease. Yeah, this is, um, well, it's part of the story. I, I certainly would agree with some of that framing. I, I mean, I do think there are gods of war. I mean, it certainly, when this, I, I had an experience like that. I woke up the morning of the Ukraine invasion, um, and I, it was as if it were palpable in my room. I suddenly felt a chill of the, the numinous, the gods of war had woken up. You know, the sense, and it's just like they weren't visible entities, but it was a sense of a presence uh, that wasn't just in my room, it was in, in the world now. Uh, and, you know, it's a little uh, like uh, Lord of the Rings or something, this this dark force that gets uh, animated and, and comes back. And I think it, it comes back when we forget. You know, um, I'm so struck by the cycles of history. By the time we've lived long enough that we haven't really encountered this within our own living memory, we're much more vulnerable to these kinds of actions. You know, the number of World War II vets who fought in the last World War, uh, most of them are gone now. They're, they're, and they're in their 90s and hundreds now. And we're getting to the place where we don't remember this. It's just like with the pandemic. We didn't remember what a pandemic was. And then suddenly we're we're back, and it's it's that sense of collective forgetting, and that's where I think some of the television seduction occurs, because we can't remember what it's really like. People who remember the horror, they 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 can't be seduced by that sort of thing. So I think that's one of the the elements for us. Um, and the second thing I would say is that war metaphor that Hillman's using there is based on an, uh, it's a kind of evolutionary model of competition. And I think that model, the Darwinian model of competition, which is so central to the thought processes of Western culture, now much of the world, is inadequate and insufficient. I think Yes, there is terrible, con you know, nature is red in tooth and claw, for sure, animals kill one another and eat, but only, they don't go to war, you know, they, they, they stop, there, there's a, a kind of, uh, one's needs uh, end uh, and don't extend into those kind of huge social explosions. And we've forgotten that there's a cooperative side, or that's what we're learning. And I think this is the recovery of indigenous knowledge. This is the recovery of understanding of the way things are deeply interconnected, like forests and so forth, that there's a whole cooperative side of nature that keeps this war piece in balance. But we've lost track of it. We only see competition. Uh, and so long as we see competition, then we have, then we're paranoid that we will be defeated by something that will overpower us. And we don't think about how could we engage in a competitive way. And, that this, is why the European, and this is why the European states or European Union states are running to invest more and more in uh, in uh, in the army. In, in uh, sure. And uh, it's really scary. My yes. question is, what is the ultimate meaning of this war? And maybe let me try to, to share my thoughts, which are not psychological per se, more psychopolitical, but mm. I feel that Ukraine, and not since a month ago or six months ago, but since 2006, 2008, with the election of Yanushenko, Yanukovych, and then the Maidan, 2014, is really telling us, hey guys, Europe, United States, we're not interested in your BMWs, Mercedes, Hollywood, McDonald. We want to be able to become a democracy whose institutions are healthy. What does it mean? It means, look at you, at the US, you had Obama elected, re-elected, and then there was Trump with the tension, with which, but the institution although January 6, 2021, were healthy enough to, yes. to cope with the tension and to elect someone else 
and not to switch to an authoritarian regime or dictatorship. This is for me the ultimate meaning of these wars. Yeah, well, yes, I mean, when I compare <clears throat> you know, sort of 1920s, 1930s Germany to the United States, you know, when I look at the comparisons between Hitler and Trump, uh, I think one of the main differences for the United States is we had a much stronger constitutional history and we had the mechanisms of government were so much more entrenched that, that they got swept aside during the, you know, at the end of the Weimar Republic and there wasn't any ability to really challenge that. And even so uh, in the United States, I felt like it was extremely close. Mm. Um, we were on the edge of something that could have been catastrophic and I, I wish I could feel safe that we are out of it, but I don't believe it. I think we still have more of this struggle to go. I think it's about, again, this regressive restoration of yeah. a fantasy of greatness. It's, an, it's a narcissistic, you know, sort of longing for grandiosity. Yeah, and actually I was reading the newspaper today, and uh, as you might know, uh, Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, won again. Yes. Actually, on Sunday, France is going, or very soon, France is going to elect a new president. What happened if Marie Le Pen wins? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's something interesting. Uh, and talking about Putin, Orban, Trump, Obama, Marie Le Pen, is to talk about the father, perhaps the fatherland. We Jungians like very much the concept of compensation. And one, could say that this war is about compensation. The Second World War was compensation of the second one. So this war is to compensate the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so Russia, the father, fatherland compensation. I have this idea that when one become a shame of his father, like yeah. Freud or like Jung, yeah. perhaps, it of course yes. shamed of his emperor, for example, or even Putin was shamed of what Gorbachev did, even what Lenin did. He blamed Lenin. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> Strange moment. Yeah, we will we will get to the psychopathology in a bit, but <laughs> let's laugh about it. So when one become a shame of the father, because Freud, Jung thought their father was a hero. Mm -hmm. Their fathers proved to be no hero. So my fantasy is that they, Jung and Freud, needed to compensate this problematic, becoming themselves heroes. Is this the case with Putin? Is this the case with modern nations that have to step in when the father was not able to show them and confirm that they are heroes? Well, that's, that may well be a part of the psychodynamics of the individual. Uh, I certainly would see the wish to pick that up. The question is, why is it also true for the whole society? It isn't because, you know, Putin has an army that's going in there and, and I guess they're under his control and I, I know the paranoid structures and so forth, but still there is some levels of buy-in. It's This is not just, it's not just his individual psychopathology in my mind. And I've gone back over the, the question you were raising. I've gotten very interested in um, the work of, actually it's a colleague uh, in, from Rome in, at the uh, Sapienza University, Vittorio Loredo. He's done this work on what's called the adjacent possible. This is a model of how things evolve. You know, it's how does culture, how does culture change? How does it evolve from this state to that state? And the usual mechanism is by uh, gradual steps. To illustrate what the adjacent possible is, if you've ever had a dream of finding a new room in your house, you know, and, and you go into that room and it's exciting, and uh, that would be the adjacent possible, and often there's a, another door that will lead to yet another adjacent possible. That's one of the pathways for development. Once in a while, there are individuals who try to take a very big leap. I think Jung did this, but I would say, think about Leonardo da Vinci. The, da Vinci designs tanks and submarines and you know, helicopters, but they've got rope and wood. 
<laughs> you can't build those things. So his imagination jumped over what was possible and with the resources in his culture. It jumped into what they would call the far possible. And if you don't have the resources to support the far possible, then it collapses. And I think that's what happened with Gorbachev. I think he had a political vision of where Russia might go. He made this visionary leap but he did not have a society that was in any way, shape, or form in a position to, to really work out the steps of how to get there. And so I think what Putin is in some ways doing is resetting things back to the Cold War in some way to create a pathway. Now, I don't think he's trying to reproduce the pathway. Uh, he's trying for an alternative pathway. Uh, one that I think is very much invested in returning the heroic fathered fatherland. I think in that sense, you're absolutely correct. That, that, but it's a failure. It's, the regression is because of the failure of this leap that, that, that was too far, that couldn't be sustained. My next question would have been, uh, and really because it's really spot on, uh, what would Russia and Europe be like today if Gorbachev had been allowed to continue his work. And I think it's important because Gorbachev, when he was ousted by the coup in summer 91, he decided not to fight. Yeah, yeah. He didn't and he was ousted when he was in Crimea. And Crimea is a region of contention. So it's interesting symbolically. Yes. He, was, he was too much in the future for, for actually what the people and the psyche could sustain. Shall we look into psychopathology for a bit? Okay, sure. Um, is it useful, is it inappropriate to psychopathologize Putin? This is the question that everybody asks, and I know your answer, but uh, what do you think? Well, I don't think it's possible not to. I don't think it's possible to be a clinician and not look at behavior and say, my God, this is indicative of. Um, the, the question, though, that I get anxious about is it's it's a little bit too quick a conceit. Yes, I can probably make a diagnosis based on behavior and reactions to things, but then I don't understand how that works in the in the larger context of the society and the culture. And um, again, I think Trump has been in a huge challenge for us in the United States. We had the Goldberg rule, you know, that if you were a psychiatrist, you were not to diagnose a political person unless you actually had interviews with them directly in person because it was a kind of violation of professional ethics. So I understand that piece of it, but I think the natural human response is, of course, to say this has the feeling of. The question is, what do we do with it then? Is that good enough? I mean, there's a way of being self-satisfied and smug. Okay, now I know he's such and such. And isn't he dangerous because of that? But you know what? That had zero impact on the American public and changing the things around Trump. So diagnosis, I think, um, only if we can use it effectively. And how do we do that? How do we treat that if that's the case? For me, it's very important to look back at after the catastrophe, mm. where Jung says that, um, describing Hitler, he was hysterical and he was a liar. And I would say that these are two of much more uh, mm. characteristics, not even symptoms, but characteristic of a modern populist. Uh, Putin is lying. Is denying Bucha, for example, and I like that Bucha sounds like butter, and they were really buttering out. Yes. Uh, then he called Ukrainian Nazi, neo Nazi, yeah. he called for genocide in the Donbass. And for me, this sounds like a perfect projection because what he's doing now is actually genocide, although many historians don't want to call it genocide. But what he's doing is really. The compensation of his projection. Yes, I would even go so far as to call it a projective identification. You put into the other what you do not will, are unwilling to acknowledge about yourself. You're a genocidal murderer, and therefore I'm. I, I have the right to to um, treat you in an inhuman sort of way. 
I think the the evacuation of the kind of shadow elements of his own psyche or of the collective psyche he's working with, um, and these kind of lies are really part of that. They're they're um, they're a very vicious way of um, you know sort of trapping someone in a paranoid structure that they can't get out of. I mean, quite honestly, you know, as a clinician, when there's a projective identification to be dealt with, you have to do a lot of work on countertransference to metabolize that, to really understand if you're going to be able to make some kind of meaningful engagement. If you just, you know, when you do supervision, you probably know this, if you see a projective identification and the therapist gets caught in it, then you get mutual. Uh, and, and then there really is annihilation energy that's operative between the individuals. So I, I think that's one of the things is to recognize that and to not to not just absorb it, not just to take it in, uh, but to begin to hear well, what is it that he's trying to talk about? What is his paranoia about around that? I think what, meaning do, you, that, what do you think is his paranoia about? Well, I, I think he's. He's got a, something going on where he sees the country as beleaguered, that Russia has been, from the Soviet days, has been shrunk. It's On one hand, it's a kind of deflation, you know, the loss of uh, a greater, larger identity. But at, at on the other hand, I think there's this fear of being invaded and encroached upon that creates these kind of paranoid feelings uh, of uh, they're, they're out to get me and they're about to annihilate me. And these then become the justifications for annihilating the other. I mean, it, it, it is, there's nothing that can be done in terms of negotiation. I mean, I'm, I've been very interested to watch the Ukrainian president's uh, overtures for some kind of negotiation. I mean, he's looking for that middle ground, but on the other side, it's as if there isn't even a possibility of the middle ground. I want to ask you a very, very difficult question because I don't want to sound banal or just irrespectful, but we tend to blame the leader. So we blame Putin, we blame yep. Yep. Trump, we blame Hitler. Yep. But all these people are human beings. That's right. The question that is very difficult, uh, and, and I want to put it very direct, maybe so blunt, is... Are Russian, and I mean all Russians, the pro and the cons, are all Germans, the pro and the cons, are all Americans, the pros and the cons, responsible? And all the Italians with Mussolini, with Salvini, etc. My ask is, if we follow Jung's um, after the catastrophe, he's saying the leader is something that comes brought into power by the collective unconscious. So it's a mirror of the collective psyche. And maybe even those that are against this leader, those that will suffer by the leader, this is the difficult part because then it could be turned against us. Uh, yes, I think this is, for me, this question has come up in the United States about our long history of slavery and now racism and the fact that we're looking at systemic forms of that and that um, I think it's been hard to watch, you know, I look at it myself, I look at it in colleagues, that these things are so embedded in the culture that even if you do not follow the practices, even if you do not uh, articulate the thoughts, it's, it is imbued in the culture everywhere. All of the, the things that you can't... Um, just say, well, I wasn't here at the time. My family was an immigrant, so I'm not responsible for what happened. Well, I live in this culture. I live in this atmosphere. So the question is, what is my relationship to this? Uh, you know, it, I don't think it's about just getting into a guilt complex because we're in one culture or another. But there is something about really taking in a, a larger view, an ecological view of our cultures that... Um, that we don't let shame split off. You see, that's what often happens, it seems to me, that these leaders work off of um, anxiety about shame. I mean, heavens, that's what Hitler did around the, the German humiliation uh, from the Versailles Treaty. It was so awful that people felt such shame and rage that he was able to mobilize that. And so it seems to me it's getting hold of things like 
our shame about our collective histories in each of our countries and not pointing fingers so much at other countries, but saying, how are we going to be in relationship with that? That's the real question. I mean, I'm doing it here at Pacifica, you know, but we've spent a year, a little over a year on with a diversity, equity and inclusion task force wrestling with what's in the basic theory that has these kinds of elements in it and how do we need to rethink these things if we are going to truly do something that shifts the ground i think it's a huge question for all of us and can we uh, join together this is what i like so much about your project here is can we join together and think together because i think collectively we have a wisdom that none of us are going to have individually and what does that start to look like? What is the collective wisdom of the, the larger international community start to say about this? Can we begin the dialogue to that? And perhaps this is the answer to my question, to my provocation, war and reset, but reset of what? Yeah, yeah, uh, I think that's, uh, it, it threatens to reset us back 75 years or so. That's certainly one of the one of the I mean, that button is already being pushed internationally. You can feel the international community is is tending to slip into that. Uh, and the question is, do we accept that reset or do we take it at a meta level and say, what's the psychological meaning of that reset and what needs to be reset? I mean, it's not like I have an answer to this, obviously, but I think your question is a, a very key one. And what's so ironic about that Clinton Lavrov uh, reset button was it was wrongly named, you know, that was, but, yeah, it was overload. I mean, <laughs> and, it and, was and, I think it was really. Yeah, maybe Freudian, a wish, a wish maybe from the yeah obama's administration but it didn't it, it didn't have any grounding no. it didn't have any reality i think obama came too soon in america i, I what i mean is he was a he was a, a young person uh, when he got into this office one of the youngest presidents and i think the burdens on him of being the first uh, African American, the first black person to hold that highest office in the land and to be a young senator without a lot of uh, uh, the kind of deeper knowledge of the kind of shadowy sides of Washington. I mean, he had such difficulty filling positions at the start of his term and so forth that there was a, a kind of repression and I uh, of the kind of what he represented as an energy. And I think the reset was some wish and longing, but I take it as a Freudian kind of wish in some way. You know, that I also wonder whether, you know, it was in Berlin in 2008 and there were what, one, two, three million people listening to him. So for European, it was really hope. But yes. it was the years of Zapatero, of Sarkozy, they were all hope that then failed. Um, he won the Nobel Prize before doing anything. Well, before after doing something great, the first American. But maybe also on that, if he thought on this wish of reset. The truth is that as, uh, Mauro Magatti, my sociological mentor on the line on Avenire, which is a Catholic uh, newspaper in Italy, he wrote on the 1st of March, he said, by bringing war back to the hurt of Europe, Putin has definitively broken the global liberal order that arose after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Then Magatti points out Putin intends to test the West resistance. And I wonder, uh, Joe, so distant are now the words of German sociologist Ulrich Beck, who pointed out that instead of talking about a declaration of independence, there should be or decla declaration of independence to be transformed into a declaration of interdependence. Mm -hmm. That is what you were saying before, cooperate and die. Yeah. And this is in a global scale because the traumatic vulnerability of all the consequent responsibility for all, including one's own survival. He says that nationalism is toxic. Therefore, he proposes a cosmopolitan perspective. Yes, and you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I have been 
pleasantly heartened to see the way the countries of the EU have begun to try to speak with a single voice, or at least around some of the atrocity in this. And I think that's useful. But, you know, it's it's one of these things that's happening under a tremendous amount of duress and pressure from the war. Um, and I, I feel, is there really, a, um, you know, what might form of that, what I would call a kind of uh, emergent form when you have a bunch of agents that interact and they create something larger, that's something that has more um, properties than you can find in any one individual, which is, I think, what we're talking about here. Interdependence is the pathway this in complexity to get to emergence, that those can be very fragile. Emergence can be very temporary and can be just uh, the pressure is released and then boom, everything returns to normal. So you don't go very far. The question is, how do you get a, uh, like an alchemical transformation, how do you fix it? How do you get a transformation into this larger interdependent awareness that becomes part and parcel of the soul of people? And that this is what guides them going forward, that that becomes not just uh, a solution to a crisis in the moment, but that crisis transformational point into a kind of a new way of being. I think that's one of the challenges for us. It's one of the challenges, and I need to make a mea culpa here, because you know about my previous series that was titled Lockdown Therapy will become a book in summer. And mm. conversating with our colleagues, with authoritative senior uh, unions, I hoped for the pandemic to be an opportunity to decelerate Mm -hmm. able to, you know, balance the inner and outer realms, um, to move from a world based on hopes and expectation to one where inferior, where interiority and spirituality are once again contemplated, even religion or religion, but not or spirituality and not their religion, the creativity of the soul. But looking at what happened during COVID, the mm -hmm of the opportunity of this balance between interiority, the inner outer balance, uh, a rush to let's become more powerful than before. I feel that the words of Michel Unbeck, the French writer who said the world will be the same after the pandemic, only a little worse. I think it was, it was naive. Yeah, I'm afraid I have to agree with them. Uh, I think about, you know, when people have asked me about this, I've said, well, you know, look what happened um, to the whole realm of airport security in the wake of 9-11 and, and um, the terrorist uh, kind of actions. Uh, we've never gone back to the kind of ease and freedom at airports where we could just walk up to the gate. Now we're all, everyone in the whole world, we're used to unloading our pockets, pushing our bags through, um, being screened uh, at all levels before we can get through. And I think Quite honestly, I have a, a, a background in science, and so I have some strong sense that what we're looking at with this coronavirus is the tip of the iceberg. You know, it, there are very good reasons to believe the coronavirus is a, a direct outcome of global warming. And the, way, the reason I say that is this is research that's done at Harvard uh, in their Chan Center. What they've shown is that how did you, assuming it's not made in a lab, and I don't think it was, that the virus, uh, this was very opportunistic, that what happened is the animals that were normally living further to the south in the northern hemispheres were migrating to higher latitudes because the planet's warming up, which brought them into contact with migrating birds and bats that normally they never would have had contact with. And so you get these opportunistic cross-species transfers, and that's what made it to the wet markets. Well, if that's the case, the whole shift in our ecology is going to bring us many more pandemics. It's going to bring us these kinds of disasters. And if we don't take the pause, if we don't really appreciate and learn to reflect on the meaning of what's just happened, and we try to go back status quo ante, I think we're going to be uh, in for more of this. I think we're going to be masked up for the rest of our lives, mm. quite honestly. And the way Corona started, uh, conspiracy theory or not, is an interesting one. But for me, what is also interesting is that the Spanish flu, 
yes. started in the US and then brought, was brought to Europe by boats, made the shift between the European empire, let's call it like the centric European empire, to the US. And now possibly there will be a new switch. So the China that produced uh, or where the virus started is shifting the, the, the power balance. Let me ask you a very difficult question for an American. Okay. Uh, what is the difference between this war and what was perpetrated by the US since World War II? Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. What about the US invasion and occupation or political destabilization since 1946 under the guise of liberating them and since 1991 under the pretext of spreading liberal democracy? Or, um, as um, uh, Maurizio Ferrara, who is an Italian journalist, uh, mm. wrote on March the 7th that the US invasion of Iraq uh, was a premeditated carnage, just like the one of the last 42 days in Ukraine, which took place after months of preparation. Um, Ferrar underlines uh, what Svetlana Alexievich already said. Svetlana, Svetlana Alexievich, Nobel Prize for uh, who was uh, drawing a very clear picture on the imperiality impulse not only of Putin, but also of a large part of the Russian population, the long wake of the Homo Sovieticus and before that of the Tsarist tradition. But what about the imperialist impulses of the US? of China right now, previously of the British crown, just to name the big ones. Every time the British invaded and occupied a country, they created problems and civil wars. When they left, for example, Kenya, Cyprus, Palestine, and they still occupy Ireland, one could also say. Mm -hmm. Are the action of the British crown and the death they caused any different than those of the US, of Putin? This is an important question, is not to say we are good, they are bad, they are bad, we are good. But it's really important in this co-construction of meaning of interdependence. Sure. That, right. What do you think? Yeah. Well, you know, I think the human tendency to preserve the status quo, to extend uh, one's own uh, hegemony over things, uh, xenophobia, is is human traits, and I think uh, they they operate throughout societies. I mean, I I don't think um, US policy is in any way free from these kinds of forces. Uh, wh whatever the rhetoric is um, that gets put on why we do these these things, um, you know, is, 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 is it as quite as systemic? I don't know. I mean, you know, the kind of rationalizations, like the, the, the whole thing of weapons of mass destruction, which we now know what a farce that really was. Um, th that took the country, I think, the, the U.S., um, it, it really shocked uh, the kind of manipulation because I think that fantasy was that uh, the kind of heroic model in this country was individual, rugged individualism that was always founded on truth. And I think that was radically um, deconstructed for us at that point. Vietnam certainly did more of that. I've, I've you know, years ago, I read the work of Gabriel Kolko. I don't know. You, he's a um, Canadian historian, a political historian. And he looked at, in the book I read, he looked at the whole um, history of post-World War II uh, diplomacy in the U.S. Which, and how it's a series of disasters. And what, what are the kind of um, anxieties and control and fears that are motivating that uh, to bring societies and what what are we doing um justifying this i mean there have been protests against some of this obviously and at least in in that sense i think one of the differences is that um one doesn't protest in putin's russia mm -hmm. you know, that, that that's completely there is no dialogue about whether this is right or not i mean in vietnam at least we could go into the streets and protest and said we're not doing this we hate it we think you're we think this is an evil war uh, I, there's nothing like that. that, that I tried to get in contact with our Russian colleagues, and uh, it's not safe for them to. It's speak. not safe. And I, and I respect it. 
Yeah, I'm me too. It's like when we do a, a webinar or something in China, we know that among the audience there might be someone else. And so we have to take care of our friends there uh, and not put them in difficulty. I want to make a last question or comment that is very important that follows the idea of cosmopolitanism and especially a co-construction of meaning. Ferrara, again on Corriere della Sera, he writes that the war in Iraq, and we all remember it, gave an important shock to Europe and to the US, of course, we could say, no, that's not a good thing to do. So in the wake of the massive streets demonstration, two great European intellectuals, Yuger oh, yeah. Abermas and Jacques Derrida, asked themselves the question, what binds Europe or Europeans together? With respect to international or they answered was a political mentality different from the American one and based on some common traits. An aversion to the use of force, first of all, and therefore an insistence on law and respect for the international legality. This is exactly what you mentioned, right? Uh, uh, proof, fake proof of... Um, their answer, uh, okay, an aversion to use of force, first of all, and therefore an insistence on law and respect for international legality support for a global system based on liberal multilateral institution and on human rights. Fruit of a past inspired by opposite principle and characterized by centuries of bloody carnage, precisely this mentality had to push Europe to build a foreign and security policy anchor to the EU, overcoming a stupid and simplistic opposition between war and peace. I feel this, that is not the political Europe, is, is not Strasbourg or the European Union, but it's really the people and the philosophy and, 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 and what makes Europe, Europe, is what the Ukrainians want. They want to join these clubs, yes. yeah. these values and say, we want to build our future base on these, a co-construction of meaning, yes. low and international order. Yes, yes, I, I think that's true. And I mean, one of the things when I think about the, the Habermas uh, Derrida statement is um, there's an acknowledgement of a depth of history in there, that this is hard won and it's taken a very long time, that, that there is a, again, from a Jungian perspective, I would talk about a gradual shift in the dominant archetypal patterns that are being uh, seen and that the the kind of failure of nationalism, uh, and I, I see the 20th century as a sort of uh, marked by a kind of a real struggle, uh, a real bastion of nationalism uh, that uh, uh, almost almost succeeded and, and and we get recurrence of that i'm i guess i'm not shocked by that um but i think the question of forming a transnational uh consciousness what does that mean you know in other words we have to start to whether it's things like global warming or coronavirus if we start not inoculating everyone in the world then we don't get rid of the virus if we don't see everybody as a part of this then what we come up with is always a, a claustrum. It's a sealed off little vessel and we have to then protect it. Um, that mentality is the one that is, at least sounds to me from I read them, the, the thing that they're saying, the historical, the weight of history has caused that kind of structuring to begin to decay, that it's recognized that that's no longer valid. I think the US is still a bit young in terms of this and it's early in their history they're learning uh, the suffering hasn't been as great i think europe when i look at the, the what happened from the middle ages on the wars and the, the kind of devastation that happened in people's own the blood the blood the blood you yeah. know i cannot stop thinking of rosa parks when mm. thinking of the ukrainian yeah. and their intensity and resistance and courage you know, standing up for your rights and hoping for a better future or someone that is very close to Pacifica, Mary Watkins, liberation, that yes. links individuation. It's not just development, but it's liberation. That's right. Yes. And that one can't be liberated if one doesn't invest in the liberation of, of one's fellows. 
male, female, whatever, uh, that, that this is something that you don't have on your own. It's not an individuation issue in that sense. It, it isn't about whether I do this personally, it's whether I am part of this um, liberation of all, not of, of, of one. And, you know, it's an idealized image, but I think it's also uh, the thing that provides a beacon of light and hope in the middle of all of this. Let's hope for a collective liberation with the words of Mary Watkins. Thank you very much, Joe. My pleasure, Stefano. Wonderful to talk with you. Thank Great you. project. Thanks.